to propose. <laughs> but it's amazing when you are really hungry, you can eat anything. And little by little we thought it was good, actually. After eight days on the plateau, we're pulling the team out this evening to this mountain lodge. There's fresh reindeer meat in the pan and a meeting with the original members of Operation Grouse. Only one person is missing, Anna Shellstrup, who died in 1995. For the survivors, the memories of that winter on the plateau are undimmed after 60 years. In fact, mm. so after we had shot the first reindeer, and the, the, the reindeer stayed in the area, then uh, that was the thing to, to do. keep us alive. Can, can I ask you all about reindeer moss? We you just think? tried it a few times, and we didn't uh, prepare it properly. Mm -hmm. The reindeer moss we used after a while, that was the contents of the stomach yeah. of the reindeer. Yeah. Mm. That we used, regularly. And guess what's cooking in the kitchen? This is exactly how the original team prepared the reindeer stomach contents, cooked in a stew with meat. As yet, our soldiers don't know what's on the menu. If they did, they might not be sitting down so readily. There are gentlemen. I did promise you we would show you the proper way to deal with the mm. reindeer moss. Not again. Thank you. <laughs> they've, they've gone very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> I was kind of hoping I'd never see it again. How's that? Well, it doesn't taste like seaweed anymore, which is the uh, the main advantage, I think, to it. Um, it tastes just like a, a bit like spinach. Yeah, it's quite quite good. It's better when the reindeer had chewed it once. It's been a huge honour for me to share this meal with the old saboteurs and to watch it bring the memories flooding back. It was Christmas Eve, 1942, and if all went to plan, six fellow Norwegians would parachute in on that night's full moon. Together, they would advance on the factory and carry out a raid so risky that few of them could have expected to escape alive. The men eating with us tonight recreated that evening for a Norwegian film made just five years after the war. It was a Christmas scene. We had a good meal with uh, reindeer meat. We had a small Christmas tree and, and we had music from the from the radio. Yeah, we had a fine time. I will be drinking Johnny Walker when I come. I'll be drinking Johnny Walker when I come. Singing I I P I I P I I P P I. So for now, Grouse had food and could build themselves up for the sabotage operation. Meanwhile, another team of Norwegian soldiers based in Scotland had been busy training for the raid. I'm now following in their footsteps to the highlands around Aviemore. Here, the Special Operations Executive had set up camps to train many specialist commando units to go back to Norway and to fight the Nazis. This is a monument to several hundred Norwegian commandos who were trained here at Avimor, living in a camp down in the valley below me. They'd all escaped from occupied Norway and were hoping with training and assistance to be able to go back and liberate their country. These were, these were volunteers. These were people who had made a conscious and physical, you know, I mean, they, they left their homeland in order to continue the fight. So these are people whose conviction was unswerving. Even now, 60 years on, there are signs everywhere that they were here. This is Drummintool Lodge on the Rothy Merkis estate near Avimor. This former hunting lodge was commandeered by the Special Operations Executive and used as a base by the Norwegians. 
One of their most promising recruits was Joachim Ronneberg, and he was asked to head the team to attack the heavy water factory. The only thing you thought of was to get on a job, to get back to Norway, to do something. And this was a terrific chance. Ronneberg was instructed to recruit five men who would accompany him on the operation. You looked for a man who, who was uh, strong and physically fit, a man that uh, you had seen through uh, exercises, uh, being good-humoured and taking stress and things with a, with, with a smile. The five men he chose were all expert skiers and outdoorsmen, who with the right training would become one of the most highly decorated commando units of the Second World War. The spirit, the way you built each other up, that was very important. I think that, that was probably one of the most important things, that you, you met with people you hadn't known before, and, and, and you felt that you had to work as a team, uh, and, and you, you, you built friendships that, well, even today, they are very, very strong. The whole area was off limits to the public. They had mock villages and railway lines set up where they could practice guerrilla tactics and demolition. Today, you can still find evidence of this training. This is the beach by Loch Morlick. And if you look into the sand here, you'll find that the beach is absolutely littered with shards of broken glass. Now that's not come from the party of a Lagerlout, that's the remains of one of the hundreds, perhaps thousands, of Molotov cocktails that they used in training here. I've heard that this hut, just a short walk away, contains yet more evidence of the days when they trained here, even though it was abandoned nearly 60 years ago. This is amazing. This building, I know from talking to the saboteurs that this was their quartermaster store. And uh, it's got all the hallmarks, big wide shelves, an old stove there. Amazing. cases. Some of them have been used for dividers in the walls here. This one's interesting. It says Quartermaster General, Norwegian Army, Norway House, Dumfries, Scotland. It, it's incredible. It's, it's almost like they, they left just yesterday. Unbelievable. The Cairngorms were perfect for training. The terrain was similar to Norway so the men could keep themselves fit for the mission. They used the rivers and hills to hone their outdoor skills, even if that did mean stealing from the local landowner. I really admire the spirit and the sense of humour of the commandos. Not only were they shooting the laird's deer, they were also poaching his salmon from Loch Morlick. This is where they did it, where the river flows out of the loch. And I asked them, well, what technique were you using? Were you fly fishing or spinning? and I got shot down. No, we were using hand grenades, of course. What else would they do? Scotland was like a second home for the men as they waited for their chance to get back to Norway. Besides their military training, Gunnerside would rely on intelligence from this man, Major Leif Tronstadt. Before the war, he'd been a scientist who had actually helped to build the factory and knew the layout intimately. I asked Professor Trunster when we should be ready to leave and he said we, we ought to be ready by the 17th of December and that meant that we had just over a fortnight to get prepared for a winter expedition to Norway. Then he told me this was very very important but he never spoke about nuclear weapons at all they, they just mentioned heavy water but you, you understood that it, it had to be very important and therefore we had no time to lose. By the end of December, everything was in place. The Gunnerside team had completed its training, and back in Norway, grouse had plenty of reindeer to feed on. The biggest problem